wondering about speaker and that's set by this, um, partly because, you know, as you're sitting there, you can see the content of your slides disappearing in front of people with presentations. Um, but mainly, because you're acutely aware that all that stands between you and refreshment is, is me. Um, so I'll try and just go on with it, basically. Life sciences, are, you know, um, as Jeremy said, I came into this um, really with the remit of trying to uh, develop the academic ideas behind uh, what uh, this college might put forward the Life Science Institute. Uh, the idea was that we develop something within uh, the kind of space that could be described as the basic sciences underpinning medicine. And we saw that very early on, really, as being what's already, we've already tried to describe in the three faculty presentations, that there's an intersection here between uh, social sciences, natural sciences, and biomedical sciences, which uh, Queen Mary does particularly well. More than that, of course, um, we wanted to make sure that anything uh, Queen Mary did was internationally competitive, um, you know, genuinely internationally competitive, and that started to address some really basic questions associated with uh, population health for the sorts of reasons that perhaps uh, Mike was alluding to earlier. Um, in what, we're, what I've been describing as the post genomic era, um, which is not yet, so you can't argue with anything else, whether that's an appropriate term or not. Um, by which I really mean that um, we, that is humankind, have been capable of sequencing genomes now for quite a while. Um, we've gone from a point where we've developed the technology to be able to do that, um, to develop the ability to understand what those genes are doing and what the kind of downstream effects and products of those, uh, those genomic changes are, uh, whether these be in terms of protein, Analyze all of those as well. We can bring this whole lot of stuff together to try and make an impact on population health. And this really starts, and I think this is where I think it gets, we can relate this back to what Bill said at the beginning. The idea of personalized medicine has actually been around for quite a long time. I think, can I remember, I, I think I can remember it being discussed probably over a kind of And really, uh, it's hard to identify really widespread benefits of what people have recognized as long period of time that is you know, a desirable thing to be able to do. And I think that we're only just getting to the point where it is now possible to start realizing these benefits. And as Bill said, it's about the timing. We are now in a time where the costs of sequencing a single human being have fallen well below a thousand pounds. Goodness knows how much money was spent sequencing the first human, human genome. Many, many, many billions of pounds. Now, anybody in this room could get it done for a thousand pounds. We add on to that the widespread availability of both environmental and social data, particularly in this country. We're particularly good at monitoring. <coughs> And <coughs> add those two things together with the fact that the NHS is moving towards, or in many places has already adopted, electronic health record keeping. And of course, we have a third advantage in this country that we have, broadly speaking, a unified health system. I attended um, a conference in Boston in uh, about November, and it's very clear there that one of the issues States is grappling with is a fragmented healthcare system. Uh, and essentially, you end up in a fight between insurance companies who don't really want to pay for work that they see might possibly be interpreted as research. So, this whole post genomic population health idea the idea is to combine social and environmental data with genome data and link. in a way that will hopefully inform uh, the development of personalized medicine, in a way that eventually will impact on the health care of the population and the life
lives of physicians. The emphasis really should be on understanding the causes of disease, but not only that, about trying to work on the diagnosis and probably more importantly as we go into the future, the prevention as well as treatment of disease. This development will inevitably, uh, as we're a higher education institution, be uh, underpinned with expanded uh, and new undergraduate and postgraduate support programs and an innovative and expansive program of public behavior, which will be, in the same way as it will build on the success of the centre itself, and will be an important component of what we're doing. To me, and I don't know whether I am possibly the only person who this slide actually works, but I, I, I'm here and I've made it, so I'll just put it on you. Um, to me, this explains really uh, what the Life Science Institute um, is going to be about. I'm, I'm head of the biology and chemistry department, right? And we get our students coming in, and they, they take various courses um, when they arrive with us. One of which will be, of course, loosely loose based around genetics. And the first, one of the first things we tend to tell them in such a course would be that your phenotype the way you appear, the way you behave, the diseases that you might uh, acquire. It is the product of an interaction between your genotypes, the genes that you carry around inside you, and your environment. And your environment here could be defined as anything outside you, but it's a sort of kind of physical and social environment. And we understand this in many modern systems. But it's hard to get a grip of this, a real good grip of this, in humans. Um, partly because we can't do the same things with humans as we can do with electronic systems. People don't really mind what you do to a Drosophila or um, a nematode worm, but they mind quite a lot if you do those sorts of things with people. But for the first time now, first time in human history, we're getting to the point where we've had all three elements of this uh, equation. We can, as I say, sample genomes relatively cheaply and therefore in large numbers. We have access to environmental data, both social and physical environmental data. And now through electronic health records, we can at least potentially access the health outcomes of people attending the National Health Service. So, for the very first time in our history, we can join these three things together in humans as well as other things. So, I've said some of what is on the slide already, and these are really the key point, key drivers, which led us to the conclusion that the, the, the particular aspect of life sciences that Queen Mary Life Science Institute might focus on and might do very well with, uh, with post-genomic population health. So this I suppose is an effort to try and convince you we just didn't come up with this, um, you know, after 10 minutes thought, um, we didn't spend some time actually trying to analyse what it was we could do, both in terms of what the university could really do and where we could make the most progress. <coughs> what have we done here? Well, um, we've divided up the kind of research areas that we might have within such an institute into these four areas society, environment, and population analysis, computational biology, translational biological research, and basic biological research. <coughs> and each of these four domains, as we've decided to call them, has two leads from two uh, different schools. I'm not going to read them out. I think most of them, if not all of them, are, are here. And these leads are helping to develop, helping us to understand what we mean within each of these demands and how they might be developed and how they might uh, take, uh, take shape over the next little while. And we'll be planning activities um, associated with each of these domains over the next year. To give you an idea of the sort
sort of scale, and to give you some idea of how far we've gone with our thinking on this, this diagram with lots of coloured circles on it, it's supposed to represent the sorts of sizes of the sorts of areas that we might have within a physical life science institute, uh, an imaginary construction that at the moment we don't have. I've definitely taken the scale of this, but the, the point is to demonstrate that we've gone a reasonable way down the road of deciding what this might actually look like. We've not fixed on a particular plan, but we have some clear ideas about the way this might head. And the numbers on the right, there are some estimated numbers of the sorts of uh, numbers of uh, permanent staff and then total research group sizes that might be associated with the various areas that you might see within such an institute. We have some uh, tremendous social science activity on the top there, in sociology, politics, ethics, law, and bioinformatics and biostatistics, computer science, going down to um, metabolomics, proteomics, lipidomics, and clinical research. Large numbers of people coming in, most of these we would hope to be new colleagues eventually, uh, within what is hopefully a new build facility somewhere down near Whitechapel, if that all works out as we like it to. Underpinning this, so that's kind of a research strategy, underpinning this is an educational strategy. As I said, we're a higher education institute, we, we teach and we do research. Within SBCS, in collaboration with the medical school, we have a successful BSc in biomedicine. This um, has been relaunched uh, to emphasize the nature of this collaboration and expand it. This is one of the main underpinning taught programs in life sciences. Jeremy's so already mentioned the fact that we've got a parallel program now operating in that chain. There are other programs that we have planned, um, which will come on stream hopefully as you know, the years go by now. Uh, in various areas, health technology, society, neuroscience, biotechnology, science of human movement. With an idea that we might be able to increase the over the total student population of Queen Mary in this kind of way. This is just the increase in these sorts of programs over time over a period of about uh, six or seven years reaching a total of maybe 1,500 new students over that period of time. We think within the academic group of life sciences that this is achievable. As well as undergraduate programs, there would be master's programs, Joe has mentioned the big, uh, the big data and bioinformatics programs, there would be others in things like e-vision in medicine, in health economics, uh, and even in public engagement. More we mentioned the life science studentships, and we had a first tranche of life science studentships, um, which um, that has been launched. The adverts of those have gone out, and they well, either just closed or just about to close. I can't quite remember exactly what the closing date was, but it's, it's very close to it right now. Uh, and then uh, we've got the, uh, the job of, uh, of actually deciding which students end up in those students. So in summary, as you've hopefully heard from the, the uh, faculty being pleased, there is a uh, life science activity all around the college <coughs> that we're hoping for a very significant development within the Life Science Institute with maybe 100 plus new academic staff, maybe 1500 plus new undergraduates, 500 or new postgraduates. This is a major activity that we've planned. What might we do on next? Where, where would we like to go within the academic group? Where well, we'd like to get to a point where we can appoint someone to really lead this initiative. We'd like to move to appoint somebody who could lead on the education side of this. That is going to be extremely important for the way this develops. We are going to have a program of events uh, through 2014. The PhD studentship program we've already mentioned. And hopefully we'll have more tranches of PhD students in the following years. 
Normally this activity really is to try and build the life science activity in the college, in the absence initially of the physical build, but in order to justify the investment in that physical build. 